right, go ahead, take a seat. Did you smile nicely at somebody near you? If you didn't, or just smiled awkwardly for someone near you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brother Wayne. All right, well, if you are just joining us, I uh, want to let you know we're in the middle of a series called Ties That Bind, and we are talking about having healthy relationships, a healthy relationship with ourself, with God, with community. And one of the things we keep coming back to is uh, just because people have grown into physical adulthood does not mean they have grown into emotional adulthood, <laughs> right? We know that's true. We know that's true for other people. Sometimes we have a hard time admitting that it is also true for ourselves. I think sometimes when we talk about, you know, Pastor Tanisha preached a great talk at 9 a.m., so if you have a chance, catch that. Um, but, you know, she, she had us take a moment to go, you know, it's easy when we're listening to talks like this about healthy relationships to be thinking about, like, yes, for sure, that person in my family needs to hear this word. I'm going to take notes, you know, for David in my family who is not in a, you know, emotional adulthood. And, but what we really need to do is get into the posture today of, yes, there are plenty of people on this earth who probably need to hear this word but I am personally delivering it to the people in this room and so just say this word is for me all right so can we just all this word is for me so just because we have grown into adulthood does not mean we are in emotional adulthood and I saw this you know in my own family in a lot of ways um, one of the ways I saw this was I appreciate I love my dad a lot and my dad my dad did a lot of good things but one of the things was my dad never learned to, de when he felt powerless, he never learned how to manage that in a good way. And so he would get angry. And I mean angry fast. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, have you ever been around someone who's like, you're just sitting normally in a car and then all of a sudden they are like zero to 60 in no time? That was my dad. So we would be at the grocery store and he would, we would be checking out and like, I, re I remember this so distinctly. Like, he would check out, the bagger would have bagged everything, and then he went to that grocery store all the time, so he really felt like the gross grocer should know him. And then they would ask for ID, and he was like, you don't know me, the Albertsons regular. And then he would like blow up and be like, we're not taking these groceries. And you know, it's like an eight-year-old, just cheeks red, you know, like so humiliated, but what are you gonna do? Like, dad, I really don't think we should treat people this way. Right? Like, and so I watched my dad, even though he was 60, 70 years old, he never learned to, to deal with his anger in a full, emotionally adult way. And that had consequences, right? And we all feel that. And so I myself work hard to manage my anger differently than him. And so I was uh, meeting with someone in the church and we were having coffee and they were catching me up on their life and they were like, yeah, actually, you know what? My job situation, um, basically I just got let go from my job unexpectedly and my housing situation is up in the air. And I was like, this is an East Bay story if I have ever heard it, right? I just feel like that happens so often. But what was surprising me as I was talking to her was she was so peaceful about it. And one of the things I would, brought to mind was I was like, hey, a year ago when we were sitting together having coffee and actually your job and housing situation was up in the air, you were devastated. And what I reflected back was a year later in a similar situation, you are dealing with it with more emotional and spiritual maturity than you did a year ago. And I just wanted to mirror that back to her. And so as we were talking, a scripture came to mind, and I felt like this is the scripture for us today. And the title of our sermon about healthy relationships is, How Did I Get Here Again? Has it ever happened to you that you have been in a relationship or something has gone sideways and then it happens again? And sometimes more than twice, third time, fourth time, any fifth time takers? All right, so we are going to be looking in the Gospel of Mark. And it is a big chunk of scripture, but it's so good for making this point that it's worth it. All right, can we look at the Word of God together? All right, here we go. So we are in Mark chapter 6. So it says, The apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all they had done. Then, because so many people were coming and going, they didn't even have a chance to eat. So he said, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
Now this seems like a great setup because they just did like this short-term ministry trip and they were like working so hard. Now they're coming, all these people are around and Jesus is like, you're my people and y'all worked hard. I'm going to take you on a spiritual vacation, right? And so they were like, yes, yes, Jesus, take me there. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them all right so they think they're going on a spiritual retreat and then they get in their little boat and people are like let's haul we can do the perimeter of the lake faster than they can in that boat and we're gonna meet them on the other side can you imagine expecting that you're gonna get to this little quiet retreat zone and then you step off the boat and literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are sitting there waiting for you like i would be like So they get there. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Now, by this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him and said, we also have compassion on them, Jesus. What can we do to serve them from this tender place of obedience? False. That is not what they said. They said, this is in the middle of nowhere, Jesus, and it's super late super late right this is subtext like and i am tired and i did not sign up for this let's keep going and see what happens send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat but he answered them you give them something to eat I feel like this is where it could have been hot. Like, no, you give them some, you give them something to eat. You send them, you send them away. Right? Like, this is where you're like, even when someone's mentoring you, you're like, we may have reached the end of this being like a happy relationship. <laughs> they said that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we gonna go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Are you imagining how big this group is? That means like our entire service is like one group. And then there's just dozens and dozens of other groups like all over who are supposed to like do what? Do what with this little bit of fish? So taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven he gave thanks and broke the loaves and then he gave it to his disciples to distribute to the people and he also divided the two fish among them all and they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish and the number of men which meaning not counting the women and children who were there was five thousand so they thought they were going to go on a spiritual vacation and in fed they, instead they went into like a massive feeding of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. What do you think they are supposed to take away from this experience? Right? I think it's easy when things like this happen, especially if you've been around the church, you're just like, yeah, that's the story of the feeding. But what are they supposed to? I really want you to talk to your neighbor for a second. What are the dis disciples supposed to take away from this experience? Talk to your neighbor for a second. Let's work it out. All right, do you have some thoughts? Do you have some theories? Well, let's take a look. Let's see how the story progresses. So they sit down and then right afterwards, it's immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him. So they cross over, they do this feeding, they get back in the boat. And then he dismisses the crowd. 
And after leaving them, he went up onto a mountainside to pray. And later that night, the boat's in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Right? Now, you have to admit, like, this is when you are at the end. Like you can't even be cute anymore. Like you thought you were gonna get that restful retreat. You fed thousands of people. You got in the boat to leave those people and now there is a storm. Like, I'm never gonna, I hate boats. I hate all you in this boat with me. I barely like him and he's not even in this boat, right? Have you ever been there? Is it only me? Am I the only person who is occasionally unsaved in the name of the Lord? All right. All it takes is some bad traffic on the 580 and I lose my salvation, so. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, just walking on the lake. Again, this is one of those things when you follow Jesus, you're like, yeah, yeah, Jesus walked on the water. No, saints of God, picture it. You're tired, and all of a sudden, something is walking across the water towards you. Your first thought isn't going to be like, that's probably my mentor. Is that my mentor? That's not, no, it's weird. It's the middle of the night, you're exhausted. So when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it's me, (laughs) it's I. (laughs) Like, what would you, okay, don't be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with them. (laughs) No, for real, it's me. (laughs) And the wind died down. Hi, Jesus. They were completely amazed. Now, this is what's interesting. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So, they were supposed to learn something in that feeding, which if they had learned it, would have made this experience with Jesus different. They might not have been afraid, but because they didn't learn the lesson of the loaves, they're missing, they, they, they are not seeing Jesus clearly, they're not seeing themselves clearly, and their own spirit, their hearts are hard. I think one, this is just a humbling story about being a follower of Jesus because they literally just participated in a huge miracle. They literally were the hands that passed out a miraculous amount of bread and a miraculous amount of fish. And you can be participating in ministry. You can even be participating in a miracle and not be learning what you need to learn about Jesus and yourself. So that is what is going on. And I think that puts all of us on alert. Just coming to church doesn't mean there's transformation. Just singing a worship song doesn't mean you're absorbing the truth of God. Just hanging with Christians is an, even a divine encounter with the miraculous does not mean you have learned the lesson. So this is what's so fascinating. Let's go ahead one chapter. Let's go ahead one chapter. So now we're in Mark 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on these people. They've already been with me three days. Why is he waiting so long? Why is he hanging around a giant group of hungry people with his disciples? What is he hoping will happen? I think he's trying to give the disciples a chance. But now they're too hungry. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered him, but we're in this remote place. Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Does this seem familiar to you? Have we been here before? In this literal, exact scenario, saints of the living God, are they asking the same questions? They are. So where in this remote place can we get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? 
Have you seen this question before? Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground when he had taken the seven loaves, given thanks. He broke them, gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. Really? He gave thanks for them and also told the disciples to distribute them. This is creepily familiar, right? To one chapter later. So the people ate and were satisfied. After the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After that, he sent them away. He got into the boat. Does, does any of this ringing a bell? This is the exact same thing again. And he went to the region of Dalamanutha. And the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. And they tested him and they asked him for a sign. And he sighed deeply. Jesus is tired in his spirit. He said, he like, this is it. They asked him a question and he went. Why does this generation ask for a sign? I tell you no sign's going to be given to it. We won't. But the thing is, he says that right after what? A sign. Because what we're seeing again is you can be in the presence of a sign. You can be in the presence of a miracle. That isn't enough to help you see it. Your own heart has to be transformed by Jesus and humble and teachable to him so you can see it. Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given. Then he left him got back in the boat, crossed to the other side, and the disciples had forgotten to bring bread, <laughs> for, except for one loaf that they had with them. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod, right? This is a parable. He's like, Jesus, yeast is this little thing, right, that you put in flour, and it spreads all the way through, and it changes the whole loaf. So he's basically like, be careful of that little Pharisee attitude. You get a little bit of that that spreads all over your whole life. But their response to this is, is he talking about the yeast of the Pharisees? We don't have enough bread for this boat trip. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Look at what he's trying. He's asking questions. As he's clearly frustrated, but he's trying to draw out a transformational process. Because he's asking these questions to try to get them to do some internal work so they can move into greater spiritual maturity. Because even when Jesus is mentoring you personally, if you're not willing to do the work, the change is not going to happen. Right. Sometimes we feel like, mm, if I had the incarnate Lord in my life, like, I would probably be glowing all the time. <laughs> I think this, this story needs to humble us. Yeah, right. <laughs> needs to humble us. So he, he, they just cannot understand that he's trying to do something deeper beyond this like superficial bread situation. So are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes to see? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? And then what's really interesting is then he does this healing. He took the blind man by the hand, led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes, he put his hands on him. He asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored. See, the thing is, the healings in the Gospels are both examples of Jesus' power, but they're also parables. And this is a parable. It's someone who is blind. Now, can Jesus heal someone on the first try? Yes, he can. He can heal people remotely. So the fact that he's taking two passes at healing someone who cannot see yeah. is that this healing is a parable for the disciples of the very process he's trying to take them through. I'm trying to show you something through the feeding. Do you see who I am? Oh, I'm sorry. Like, do you want a mirror? Like, do you, what, right? No. Then he does the exact same thing again. And so I felt like, man, this story speaks to us. As we're talking about moving into emotionally healthy relationships, the disciples are literally doing a, we've been here once and we didn't learn, and so here we are again. Now, on one level, it's encouraging because Jesus cares so much, he's willing to walk them through it more than once. On the other level, it's humbling and sobering because if you don't learn 
the lesson, you can't move on to the next thing. You got to keep circling this lesson till you learn it and then move through. So I want to ask you one more time, what do you think is the lesson of the loaves? Because it's easy to look at the disciples and be like, y'all don't get it. What are they supposed to get? Talk to your neighbor one more time. Take another pass at it. What is supposed to be the lesson of the loaves? there's a lot I want us to focus mainly on this journey of going around twice but I think some of what they're supposed to see there's hints of it inside the first feeding when they get out of the boat and it says Jesus uh, they look to him like sheep without a shepherd cue me up what Old Testament psalm is that going to take you to sheep Psalm 23 Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me sit down. Um, he makes me lay down in green pastures. So later in the story, when it says that they sit down on green grass and he's setting up a banquet for them in the desert, he is trying to show them that the good shepherd that they've been hearing about for generation after generation is here shepherding them. He's God. And I think as people who've been around church, we can be like, mm -hmm, yeah, Jesus is God. But we have to de, like, we stop getting into those rote answers because that revelation was hard to come by and understand. But if they had understood, then that's why when Jesus kind of crazily walks on water, it would have made more sense to them if they had begun to grasp what he was revealing about who he was. But let's talk a little bit about this journey. Now, I want you to think, have you ever repeated a relational mistake more than once? Anybody? Anybody? Only two saints in the back. Raise their hand. <laughs> See? So let's, we, we can all come in this, we can all up, because we know this is true for all of us, right? So let's try to at least learn some lessons when we come back to the same thing. One of the places where I saw this was I had a good friend, and uh, so, you know, when we would talk, she was always talking about how people in her workplace, like, didn't get her, you know? Like, people in her workplace didn't get her, and they, like, didn't respect, like, how skilled she was. And as, when you're, like, the friend, when you're, like, on the squad side of stuff, you're like, mm, that's right. You know, you're like, mm, those people are doing you dirty. Like, you are underappreciated. But what I remember was, the fr what, what, when I first met her, she had just left a job in, like, w one part of the country and come to L.A., where we were both living. And then after, like, a few years, that her job sort of went sideways there. But it was like, we were squad. So I was like, mm, they're doing you dirty. So then she moved to another part of the country. Guess what happened to her work situation there? Those people were doing her dirty. <laughs> and then I went to work with her. And I was like, ooh, girl, it's you. <laughs> I was like, I love you, and we're friends, but uh, the problem is you. <laughs> you real, real tough to work with. And you extra tough to work for. And the thing I could see was, she was doing what a lot of us do, is you go to a new place, and even when the exact same thing happens, who do you blame? Them. Those people. 
they need to do their work. Now, that can work sometimes, and sometimes it is them. I'm not saying that we don't live in a world full of people who are like misogynistic and patriarchal and full of microaggressions and racist is all, you know, racist as a day is long. But sometimes, saints of the good Lord Jesus, sometimes, sometimes it's you. <laughs> sometimes it's me. <laughs> And sometimes when the same thing keeps happening, like I see this happen a lot in romantic love, may I be real. When I see the beloved saints of God be like, mm, oh, men, the trash. And I'd be like, blueberry yogurt. <laughs> beloved child of God, you keep picking men like that. There's plenty of grown and good men on this earth but you like drama. So you keep dating people who create drama. Like literally they'll be like, I don't know, he cheated on his last girl, but I'm sure he won't with me. <laughs> are we working for Disney? Is this a fairy tale? Like what are we doing right now? And when that happens again and again, you have to say, what is the common factor in these ongoingly dramatic relationships? It is Marcel. We have seen it. We have been it. So what can we do to not continue circle, circle, circle? Well, one of the things is what I see is that Jesus is trying to help the disciples reflect on their experience. He wants, that's why he keeps asking them questions, right? He doesn't just come up and be like, the secret of the loaves is, I'm God. Because even if someone tells you the truth, you can't absorb it. You have to do the work. If someone tells you the truth about yourself, sometimes you can't absorb it because you have to do the work yourself. So he's trying to get them into this process to make them reflect. And so I would say, when something difficult is happening, when you feel the stuckness, when you round the corner on the same thing one more time, are you asking yourself helpful questions? And are you letting your friends and mentors ask you challenging questions? Because sometimes we just want our friends to always tell us that we are the best and they are the worst. And I understand that there is a window for that, right? I saw somebody at the church, and I knew they had just gone through a breakup, and they, it was early on, and I was like, do you need me to hate that person? And I was like, we can be in that phase for two weeks, and then we're going to talk about it, right? But if you only let your friends be the cheerleader, but you never let your friends who see your life laid out, maybe ask that challenging question, you will stay stuck. And if you say that's not a good friend because they're pressing into your life, that is a lie. Only someone who loves you is gonna bother to do the emotional labor of stepping through your defensiveness and your unself-awareness to try to help you do better next time. You think someone who doesn't love you is gonna do that? I mean, maybe there's like a toxic person who just likes to say mean stuff to you and your family. I'm not talking about that person. I'm talking about your friend who's taken the time to come to you in a kind way and say, maybe you should think about what is drawing you to these kinds of people. Yeah. And if you are like, you're not a good friend because you're not supporting me, that is not true. That's real love. Because when I do that for a friend, I have worked myself to do it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I took a jog, I lifted some weights. I was like, oh, like we gonna go there. What if they're really mad at me? Like, I'm a conflict avoider, but if I see a friend hurting themselves repeatedly, that's love. I'm trying to get them unstuck. And sometimes Jesus is trying to get us unstuck, and we think he's being mean to us. I think some of, when I was praying about this in terms of how do we get unstuck, I think we all have to know that we have to do work with our family of origin, right? None of us grew up parented by Jesus. All right, or God himself. So even if you have fantastic parents, we're gonna have to do some healing. And what happens when you grow, when you're like a little 
impressionable little human and there's brokenness in your family, whatever is the brokenness in your family gets imprinted on your soul like that's normal. Right, so, you're, so sometimes you know you see it, you'd be like, um, it's like a stereotype, like girls from bad families end up in bad relationships. And you're like, and it's like, it's, it's, it's as if it's inexplicable, people don't, but I'm like, it's because that young woman's soul got calibrated to not having a man in her life care for her in a steady way. So even though her soul longs to have a man care for her in a steady way, and I'm sorry, every example is like so heterosexual today. I'm gonna rework these examples, but <laughs> nevertheless. Um, so, you know, she wants, uh, she wants that kind of love in her life, and, but then what her, what is cal her soul is calibrated to the drama. Her soul is calibrated to actually someone who treats her poorly. So she keeps going out and finding that. And if we don't do the work to reparent ourselves and let Jesus reparent us, we're gonna just keep circling, circling, circling. You know what I'm saying? Now I will give an encouraging example that I saw here that, because I think we can, you can hear that and be like, I'm stuck in a cycle with my family. I'm never going to get out. <laughs> my life is a merry-go-round of dysfunction. That's not true. That's not true. I saw a beautiful example of someone having a second go-around and them coming at it differently. Um, a couple weeks ago, we had, or actually a couple months ago, we had a panel by some of our LGBTQ family. Were you guys here? There was Chat and Chew, and we had some of our... Uh, queer fam up here sharing their experiences in the church and it was it was such a gift to us it was both beautiful and sad to me um, pastor Mike asked Chris a question I asked him uh, kind of what's a high point for you in the church since you've come out and he said right now on this panel because there's so many spaces of alienation for our queer fam and um, afterwards, I turned to one of the women in the church, and, and she said I could share the story. And I was like, oh, how was the panel for you? And she said, I'm learning so much. I'm learning so much. Because when I was growing up, things were really different. And my brother came out, and my mom was so harsh to him. And so me and my sisters, we didn't know any different or any better. So we were very harsh to him, too. But now I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this panel and my nephew is coming out to our family and now I can deal with it and respond and treat him so differently because I've learned more so I can be different. It was so beautiful, so beautiful coming around a second time and letting God transform her so she didn't have to respond in the same way that she was taught to respond by her mom. Can you imagine how beautiful and healing that's going to be for her nephew to have this aunt who is coming into that with love and teachability? That is, that's coming around a second time and growing and transforming. Amen? So I just want to say, I don't bring this up to be like, we're all stuck. It's to say, second time around is a second chance for growth. Jesus loves the disciples so much that after saying you haven't learned about the lesson of the loaves, he doesn't go and find another group of disciples. <laughs> right? <laughs> Even if he's deep sighing the whole way through, he goes around and he goes, let's do it one more time. And even then when they don't get it, he sits there laboriously drawing out the process because that's the depth of love and commitment that Jesus has to your transformation and growth. Here's a coming around second time that encouraged me. For me, um, school was a miserable place. It's miserable. Like, I don't know, some of y'all, I mean, we just, I've shared part of this with y'all before, but it's like being around, you know, there's so many of you in grad school who just be like, oh, it's not a big deal, I'm getting my PhD, I'm just like <laughs> doing, you know, uh, just thought, thought leader in 2019, just doing some academic research that no one's ever heard of, it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, and I'm like, cool, 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 I love being pastor at this church. Um, I'm super smart. But when I was all the way through school, I was the kid who, like, I almost got kicked out of middle school because I skipped class so much. I literally would just go hide in the library because I felt so stupid. I just literally didn't want my teachers to see me. 
I didn't know how to do homework. My parents didn't know how to help. I'm going to tear up just because it was a sad time in my life. It only lasted for 15 years. It's okay. So, um, <laughs> but I didn't know how to like do work. I didn't know how to keep up. I knew I was smart, but I was failing at school. You know, and then my grades would come home and my parents, my Korean immigrant mom would just be like, like literally I came to this country to, and I'm sending you to this school and I just, it was devastating. For years this pattern went on. I hated school. And when I went to college, I, uh, I almost flunked out my first semester. And then I remember Jesus said, when I went home for Christmas vacation, he said, go back to your high school campus. And I'm not that person who's like, oh my God, I love going back to my high school campus. It's just so nostalgic. I'm thinking about Bobby and how much I liked him. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, we can go back to the place that made me feel terrible. And I walked around and Jesus said, and he brought me back, right? Brought me back to that spot. And he said, I really don't care what your GPA is, but you're so full of fear and self-hate and insecurity and I'm not about you staying trapped in that. So when we go back to school, we're gonna get free of this fear that makes you hide all the time. And I can't quite explain what happened, but I just had the courage to go to class all the time, which actually helps you do better at school. <laughs> but I also began to gain the skills of doing reading and research ahead of time. Right? Like little things that I felt like other people all knew how to do, but for me was like agonizing and I didn't know how. And a semester later, I was on the dean's list. And I don't think it's because Jesus is like, I love you more because you're on the dean's list. I think my mom might have loved me more because I was on the dean's list, but um, just kidding, sort of. Um, but it was about taking me around this place that for years I had circled and had been a place of failure, and saying, let me interject myself and set you free. When I went back to graduate school in my mid-30s, school was a joy. I literally read everything they assigned me from front to back. When, even when it wasn't assigned, and they were like, read chapter three, seven, and nine, I was like, and one, and two, and three, and four. Because I loved learning. And it was such a deeply redeemed experience. And I think that we are in a world where there are not a lot of vivid images of redemption. We're, it, we have so many images of erosion. Right, like we look at nature and what's happening to the environment and so many communities and we have lots of snapshots of erosion. But redemption is this thing where it takes what is decaying and doesn't just keep it from decaying more, but turns it into something that's flourishing. Like you know all these like tragic pictures of the rainforest that have been burning? But there's this like one video on YouTube where it talks about this like random couple that was like, there's all this deforestation in Costa Rica. And they came up with a weird deal where they asked like this company to dump all the orange peels, you know, onto the land. And then they like lost their funding, so they just left for 15 years. But all that stuff turned into fertilizer, and like 15 years later, that deforested area was an unbelievably lush place of growth. And we need to know when we get taken around a second, third time, if we keep ourselves there, yes, it feels like stuckness and toxic and it feels like death. But if we let Jesus draw out the process towards maturity, it can become a place of transformational life. And the very type of thing that you used to have, like that rep in your squad, in your friendship group, as being sort of the messed up person about, you can be the person who's flourishing in that area. Because that's the kind of work Jesus wants to do in you. Amen? Amen. So I just want to invite us. Where are you stuck? And where might you be needing to say yes to Jesus, moving you from immaturity to maturity? Where do you need to go from blaming that person over there to doing some hard work of looking at yourself? I'm not saying that some of y'all don't have toxic people in your lives. I've heard about some of y'all's families. 
is really going on in there. But you can also change how you are interacting with that toxicity. Sometimes it is that you finally feel the freedom to put some distance and some boundaries. What I see happening is self-reflection and communication. Self-reflection, communication, staying, interacting with Jesus and staying in community. Because Jesus wants to do that work. So let's just take a breath. Here's the last thing I'm supposed to say. I said some of us are calibrated to drama, and I just want to talk about that because there's not like a lot of movies and songs out there about what is amazing about maturity. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, that movie was really about how that person was grown and did their work. Most movies are about all the drama that comes from not doing work, and I get it, that makes for good movies. But I want to testify that being in relationships that are steady, with steady love, that handle conflict thoughtfully, that offers support when it's fun and when it's challenging, friends who will support your dreams and support you through your mental health struggles, that being in a marriage where people are both, both people are working on their character. It doesn't feel familiar, but steady love and mature relationships are where it, it's life-giving and you can flourish in that. So many of us are used to all of our bandwidth being taken up with chaos and crisis and drama. We can't even imagine a world with steady love with maturity. And so even as we get close to it, we blow it up. We only know the toxic version of things. I mean, I see this a lot, actually, I saw this um, when I would work with couples in college who were dating, and you know, I, I grew up in a more conservative context, and so uh, people were not s having sex before marriage very much, as much, all the time. Everyone's always having sex before marriage, but. Um, in this context, you know, they felt some kind of way about it, is what I'll say. <laughs> and so they felt like, oh, they weren't supposed to, but they were hooking up and doing this and that. And they were, and they were trying to process this as Christians. But then what would happen, and I get that, we would talk about it, there was not about shaming them, but it was, you know, but it's what they were going through. And then they would get married, but what would happen is they would get married and think like, oh my gosh, now sex is going to be amazing, because we're going to have sex all the time. And I'm going to let some people's dreams die right now, but that's not really true. Um, but also, <laughs> um, they realized that they didn't want to have sex once they were married. Because they associated sex with being something they had to sneak around to do. And it was only fun when it was something they might get in trouble for. But once you get married and it's happening in this like committed context of mutuality, they had no category basically for sex in a committed, open, non-hidden, non I'm trying, I'm working through all my Christian guilt issues. And so they had to spend a lot of time figuring out how to enjoy something that was always meant to be a gift, but they had calibrated it over to another place. And so you can get there, but I think, um, and now I'm like, Jesus, why'd you have me tell that whole story? <laughs> Literally in my notes it says sex dash sneaky. <laughs> I think the point that the Lord was trying to have me make. <laughs> was he's always trying to give us good gifts, but we have to keep letting him recalibrate them into the right context, into a healthy context. We don't even know how to pursue the thing we want. 
And sometimes when we get the thing we want, it doesn't feel right because we're calibrated over here. Because this is what we've seen, drama, toxicity, screaming, crying, yelling. The invitation to maturity, it's unfamiliar, but it is freedom. You know, we talk about liberation all the time in terms of social justice. Maturity in your character and mature life with Jesus is liberation. Liberation from drama, liberation from toxicity, liberation from your messed up patterns, liberation from how your family did it, liberation from generational sin, liberation from generational divorce, liberation from generational alcoholism. Doing your work is also justice and liberation. So let's seek God on that. All right, Woo. let's sing a song to Jesus for a minute while I regroup after sneaky dash sex. So. People are gonna be like, Pastor Mike be like, I'm never leaving again. He's preaching at his home church in San Jose today. He's gonna watch this live stream and be like, going back to I'm a friend of God because God is our friend but he's not the friend that's just gonna you know support you in whatever you're doing he's the friend that wants to bring you real life amen and uh, I do I want us to get prayer because I think that there's some of us who are feeling snuck stuck in situations and I want you to get prayer um, to get unstuck and to do that work and so I want our prayer ministers to come forward if you will and let's just sing I'm a friend of God and uh, let our friend and Lord do that transformational work in Our prayer ministry team folks would come up.
help each other. Our live groups really are a place where we're going to try to equip each other with practical tools to get out of some of these patterns. We have our mental health services because we know sometimes we need a therapist to help get us out of these patterns. I love my therapist. My therapist was at my wedding. Thank you, God. I was like, girl, no, you know this, so thank you. Whatever we need to do, let's be intentional. Let's not have to go around a third, fourth, fifth, sixth time. Amen? Y'all are so beautiful. Jesus just loves you so much. Never giving up on you. But let's catch it this round, this time. Amen? Amen?